lot of competition at this hour, so thank you for um, your interest in drivers of aging. And I'm going to you know, leave you today with a few homework assignments. It's truly an honor to talk at this conference. I was here six years ago when you were in Aspen. It has grown so much into such important areas. I love the culture that um, Susie and GWS inspire of really people being much larger than individuals and working together. Um, so I'm just thrilled to be here. So let me talk about really coming down to the simplistic idea of slow and fast aging. So age is the biggest predictor of when we die, period. But within that, tremendous differences, because underlying age is biological age. Biological age is very elastic, as we know. So what are the drivers of biological age? Some people age in dog years much faster than others. And we now know some of these mechanisms. Telomeres is just one mechanism. There's no one cellular aging mechanism that is the driver of aging. They work together. They're all super tightly correlated. Telomere length, which I'll talk about, is best friends with mitochondria, reactive oxygen species, other aging mechanisms. Uh, but we can measure telomeres very easily. We now know that telomere length is causally predictive of of disease. So it's not just a correlate, it's not just something that gets worse with age, it's genetically, people who have genetically short telomeres tend to have much higher odds of cardi early onset cardiovascular disease, dementia, other diseases. So what is a telomere? So there is our chromosomes. In those strands are our genes that make us who we are, that create every protein that is our body. We must protect those genes. Aging is about DNA damage. It's damaging things so that we're creating worse proteins that can't repair, et cetera, as we age. So how do we protect the genome? One of the major focuses is this cap at the ends of our chromosomes, the telomeres. It's just a wound up strand of base pairs that is extremely sensitive to our environment, our biochemical environment in the cell, as well as you'll see our environment outside of the body. It is a canary in the coal mine. It is reading out, it is interpreting signals from our mind, from our behavior, from our environment, because it's a survival mechanism. When we're under stress, it, uh, the enzyme telomerase, that protects telomeres increases and protects the telomere. As we age, telomeres shorten. They can't always replicate as cells divide. And so we need to keep our telomerase enzyme active and healthy throughout our lifespan. So telomeres shorten slowly, but what's fascinating about them is they're not something that we just think about after 50 as we get sick. We, are, we inherit telomere length both genetically but also environmentally. It's directly epigenetically transmitted from our parents, meaning it is shaped by our parents' life experiences as well. So let's talk about the big drivers. Most of our behavior in life is influenced by these two big forces, love and social connection, fear, anxiety, and feeling unsafe. So these are big drivers, and it turns out that telomere length is also associated with these two big forces. So let me get a little bit more specific. What maintains telomere length? Childhood. Why am I mentioning childhood? We've had it. It's done. We can't change it. But childhood is a critical, pregnancy and childhood are critical periods that shape our telomeres and rate of cell aging for life. So I'm telling you this for two reasons. One is many of you may be testing your telomeres, um, which uh, you might find out you're short and you're doing everything perfectly. How could that be? Well, early childhood adversity and especially pregnancy in the womb are, are leave scars on telomeres. We're shorter for life. That's OK. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters what you do now and every day, because we can maintain our telomeres over time. So. Uh, I'm also telling you this because whatever you do, your intervention, your program, your spa retreat, pregnancy is a huge window into public health, into the future. Pregnant women are the gateway of health, and of course, women of childbearing age. And so this is a, they're very motivated. This is a tremendously important market to think about um, because whatever, boosting women's health during pregnancy 
is going to have tremendous compounding effects on both her health as well as her offspring. Um, so, habitual pathways in adulthood. So we shape our behaviors and our stress responses largely through our life experiences um, throughout growing up. And so here we are as adults. We have canalized reactive pathways, or maybe we have more resilient and calmer stress pathways. Regardless, these are important to think about because how we respond to stress every day adds up over time. And it's these daily habits that I want to talk about. So one thing we've studied is these psychological states. You guys are all experts in the behaviors, the behavior change. I'm not going to tell you anything too new about what to do in terms of what telomeres like for lifestyle because you already are probably doing them and, and you know what they are. And they're the same things. What's good for the heart is good for the for cell aging, for the telomere. But the, it's the mindset that's probably new to most people. So our threat reactivity, when we feel unsafe, we have bigger, more exaggerated stress responses that recover slower. And in, res uh, in contrast, we can have positive stress responses and we can... Do my, there are mind tricks to shape our stress responses so that we're having more of a challenge or positive response. Example, lion chasing gazelle, both having huge stress responses, very different cardiovascularly and in terms of how high the cortisol is. So that lion is having a positive stress response. He's going to gain something. He has tremendously efficient cardiac output. Gazelle is completely vasoconstricted, ready to be bitten, ready to vasoconstrict so he doesn't bleed to death, threat response. So... That might be relevant to giving a speech or when we have do acute stressful things, we can try to shape our acute stressful response. In real life, we are constantly coping with chronic situations. So it's a different type of stress as well that we need to think about. And that is thinking about how resilient we are to adapting to things we cannot control. And so we think about stress stress being a source of something that strengthens us. When we have appropriate resources, what doesn't kill us can make us stronger. So that's positive stress. We've also been studying mindset. So when we are, well, where's your mind right now? This second. Yes, thank you. And don't tell me if you're, you know, you don't need to tell me what other things you're thinking about. So when we are completely engaged and focused, this is obviously a positive state. Our, our physiology is responding. Um, this is uh, you know, a state of mindfulness that's associated with wellness. So I'm talking about informal mindfulness in the moment. A, a, a less Mind wandering is very common. We mind wander half of the time. What I want to point out to you is negative mind wandering. So notice if you are having thoughts of, I don't want to be where I am right now. I don't want to be doing what I'm doing right now. I wish things were different. That is unhappiness. That is suffering. And that is a state that we can notice uh, by becoming aware of our thoughts and, and be um, changing. So in our observational studies, negative mind wandering is associated with shorter telomere length. And in our mindfulness interventions, of course, that's one of our targets. We're trying to improve engagement and presence in the moment. Presence is associated with longer telomeres. So now we get to the health behaviors. What's damaging? What's protective? So we want to think, the guiding framework is this. Telomeres are damaged by oxidative stress, inflammation, stress hormones, high levels of insulin resistance. They're protected by restorative behaviors, sleep, high vagal tone, so when our nervous system is on restorative mode, um, and anabolic growth factors, but not unnatural ones. So just to show you visually, how can we slow aging? Most of these studies I'm showing you are cross-sectional, but there's an emerging body of intervention studies as well that show us that the telomere maintenance system is flexible, it is malleable. We can boost our health in the short term. Sedentariness is related to shorter telomeres. Exercise interventions appear to boost telomere health. Sleep quality. I don't know who last night did De Stefano's sleep ritual, but I slept better. Thank you. Sleep quality is critically important. So people who get, well, duration is important. People who get less than seven hours in the light tend to have shorter telomeres. But the quality of our sleep is also important. So having, putting ourselves into a bedtime state, having a sleep ritual that actually changes our, shifts us from the active doing mode to a more 
peaceful, ready to restore mode is critical. So I loved the sleep ritual. I thought that was helpful. There's, there's all, uh, rituals are completely personal, so it's what works for you. Eat your vegetables. Antioxidant diet. It's so simple, but it is so correlated with longevity. It's it's, in all of the hundred of diet studies, it's about vegetables, fruits, and antioxidant diet, a, high, a whole food diet. Meat, sugars, soda, these all shorten telomeres. Extended mind, my favorite co new concept. I must share with you what extended mind is because you all know this and live this. And it's a, new, it's a relatively new social cognitive neuroscience concept, and it's this. Our thoughts are not just in our head. Our mind is outside of our body, and it is shaped by social interactions that we're having with someone else. It is shaped by the environment. That's how we think. Our, th our thinking is emerging in moment to moment based on our surroundings. And so what does that mean? That means that we're influenced by people around us who are very stressed, but the converse too, we can use this for good. When we, we are emotionally contagious to each other, and there's a tremendous body of research showing how our physiology as well as our felt emotions are correlated with each other and move together and we influence in each other in these implicit unconscious ways that are so important. So being well together is really the only solution here. It's not about individuals. We think we're separate and independent. That's a complete false uh, perception. So the interventions you do, you create these settings that are so powerful. People walk into a retreat or retreat center and things are changing immediately. And it's that conditioning to these environments that is so restorative that we want to share with so many people who don't get to do have these safe havens and these experiences. So think of daily restoration. Is it the daily grind? Are you having these repeated stress reactions every day that are in wearing away base pairs? Or are you building in restoration? And uh, these, you know, these healthy behaviors, they're small, they're tiny, but they add up over years. So last topic, can meditation increase telomere health? Of course, this is one of our pet, you know, favorite topics, pet. Um, and, you know, we, we can learn from our pets <laughs> about being mindful. So one of, there's now a body of, of studies showing that different mind-body activities, there's no, there's absolutely um, nothing unique about meditation studies. We find this with Qigong and different types of uh, yogic meditation, et cetera. And what it, you know, common ingredients, focused attention, um, calm, sympathetic, arousal, et cetera. So, so these appear to boost the enzyme telomerase, and in more long-term studies may, may also stabilize or lengthen telomeres. We have a paper under review that shows three weeks at a meditation uh, residential retreat actually lengthened telomeres. So that's probably the shortest I would ever go, and that means they're eating healthy food, there's no computer, so that's a pretty intense intervention the shortest I would look. I'm going to tell you briefly about uh, one of the funnest studies I did that where Deepak Chopra opened up his retreat center. Study us. I think this is transformative. I've been doing this for, you know, 10 years, and people tell me it changes their lives. So we went in, and we measured well-being. We measured blood before and after the week. And the beauty about the study is that we got to randomize people to staying at the pool or the resort, La Costa, or being in a meditation retreat for a week and learning a new skill. They were complete novices. So. What do you think we found at the end of the week in terms of well-being, vitality, mindfulness, uh, decreases in stress? What? Oh, I, so we had the two groups that randomized. We also had a group that was an experienced meditator signed up. They were there anyway. We, you know, asked them to be in our study, give us a little blood, fill out these questionnaires, help signs. So at the end of the week, we found dramatic increases in well-being, 60% improvement on all the well-being scales and reductions in stress and depressive symptoms. And this was really exciting. We don't see changes like this in, in um, other types of interventions. This is, this is big. And it happened in all three groups. So we, you know, we are, what we're looking at is a vacation effect. People unplugged from their life, they came to this resort, didn't matter what they did, they didn't have computers, they were living a more restorative daily life. And then we looked at what was happening in the blood, and we, in gene expression, we found dramatic 
increases in the expression of, sorry, dramatic reductions in the expression of genes related to stress and immune function. So basically, all of that defense response that we've got on all day to fight with all these demons and tigers, that was just dampened completely in all three groups. So that was the huge finding. We call that the vacation effect. And then the other finding was the telomerase did boost, but only in one group, and it was the experienced meditators. And that is a pattern in meditation research, that um, novices show so some improvement, but if you're looking at brain waves, if you're looking at gene expression, it's people with experience that then are studied acutely have more dramatic responses. So it's just exciting. I know um, Mark Cohn sitting in the front is one of the few people who is actually doing a lot of these retreat studies. And it's a, a wonderful thing to partner with scientists. I know my colleagues would jump at the chance of studying one of these intense interventions. Retreats are an extremely powerful catalyst for change. And we need more research to show this. I've just learned so much being here. And of course, my first question every time I hear about one of um, hydrotherapy or one of these interventions is, where's the data? I'm, we, we really need to be studying these, these amazing retreats. My last point is thinking about how, when you think about how you want to live your day, which is what matters, right? All we can, we are all going to die and we don't know what, when. We can only hope for a good life, health span. We can't control our lifespan, we can control how our health is and, and hope that we can stretch it to the end. So thinking about the end game sometimes helps us change our behavior in the moment. So let me just ask you, not to be morbid, to think about what you want written on your epitaph, on your tombstone. What is your epitaph? None of you are probably thinking, I wish I spent more hours at the office. I wish I made more money. No, at the end of life, it's about love and relationships and connection. Have you loved fully? Have you lived fully? Have you let go of the small things? And those are actually the ingredients for our daily life as well that shape our behaviors towards slow aging, towards an expanded health span. So we can't forget the health behaviors, right? They're necessary but not sufficient. Eat your vegetables. Telling people that doesn't help because as we've been hearing over the week, a theme is people do well when they can. When they can. When their mind and their environment allows them. So present mindset appears to be related to slower telomere attrition, so in a way it's making time more elastic, even though seconds are equal, biological aging responds to our mindset. Being present allows us to connect with other people. So that leads us to this extended mind idea, wellness within can allow wellness between us, between people, and, and wellness together, neighborhoods, communities, and of course, meaningful work and purpose in life. Purpose in life, boosts in purpose in life after interventions is associated with boosts in telomerase. So our cells are listening. They know what matters most. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>so that last slide didn't show, but I just want to point out, we did, Elizabeth Blackburn, my colleague in all this work, we um, wrote a book of about a decade of uh, our research, and um, everything you could want to know, environment, chemicals, types of foods that are associated with telomere shortening, but more importantly, for those who, yay, for those who are interested in telomere testing, on my lab website, which is, um, if you just type in, uh, Aging Metabolism Emotions, UCSF, you would find it. We have uh, a sheet, telomere testing is complex. There's a lot of science to know. We don't push it, we don't discourage people, but we tell you what you should know if you're gonna do it. So that's on my website. Thank you so much.